Max and I got married in 2003 and had Caroline in 2004 and Natalie in 2005. Time with family was something he lived for. We were together for 16 years. We were best friends. Of course, he loved cars. That's what his business was. He was a pilot. He liked to fly airplanes. He loved boating and hunting. And he had a very strong faith in God. Max was unlike anyone I've ever met. He was one in a million. The girls and I, we left town overnight in February of 2020, and we weren't able to get a hold of Max, but that's not unusual for him. <laughs> he would lose his phone in his truck on a regular basis, and we got home the next day. You come in and say, I've been trying to reach you, but he had had an aortic aneurysm, and so we found him, and that started I don't even know how to describe the journey of grief. Everybody not only grieves differently, but even within a family, everyone's lost a different relationship. Where I lost my husband, my daughters lost their dad. We had great support from family and from friends and the church, it was amazing. But three weeks later, COVID started. The girls were 14 and 15 and they couldn't be with friends. and. So that isolated us for a while. We still had, you know, people bringing meals and leaving them for us. And so it wasn't, you know, like we were so alone, but you're supposed to return to some sense of normal. Normal doesn't really seem attainable anymore. I just felt completely untethered. I felt upside down, totally lost. That was very, very hard without Max when I had been doing everything together with Max for so long. So much of grief makes you feel like you're crazy. <laughs> you just are in a brain fog. For me, it was like a physical weight. I felt like I was carrying and I was exhausted all the time. Better to address it and feel it and work through it than to maybe keep it down and then it doesn't really go away. There's a saying, if you don't deal with your grief, your grief will deal with you. <laughs> it sounds like the last thing you'd want to do with your grief, but when the waves of grief overtake you, just allow it and lean into it and let it come out, let it pass. You know, it's, that's really the only way you start to make steps forward. Well, that's Janelle's story. Janelle's story is the final story of the four stories that we've been looking at as we've been going through uh, this really powerful series called Hope Stories. We all have a story and God's writing a story in all of our lives. Whether we know it or not or we, whether we acknowledge it or not, God's doing something. And his promise is he's going to do something new. Even in the face of something that on many levels seems to be, well, it, it seems to be too far gone for God to be able, be able to ever do something with it. Janelle, you would say that she and her husband, Max, they had everything going for them. They had a love. They had a family. They had kids. They had community. They, they had plans. They had plans for what they were doing with their daughters, Natalie and Caroline, that they uh, were getting through middle school into high school. And then they had plans for what they were going to do after their kids went to school, like when they would be empty nesters. And I was just talking to Janelle uh, just a few days ago, and I looked at her because we're in the middle of the craziness of schedule right now. Like, I don't remember the last day we didn't have something. And I looked at Janelle. I said, you mean that there's something that happens after your kids are in middle school? Like, we can't imagine life after that right now. And she said, we had plans. We had great plans. Plans that we were going to do. We are going to go and see the world. I mean, you think about the scripture passage. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for a future filled with hope. That's what Janelle and Max and their family was living. Long time hope people. In fact, if you were to come to the 11 o'clock service, they would be sitting in row F right here. They are Lutheran, so they sit in the same place every single week. Janelle and her sisters and her mom and her dad, their last name, uh, Janelle's maiden name is Federson. So they sit in row F, F for Federson. So if you come to the 11 o'clock service, don't sit in row F. That's just your warning. That's not a word from the Lord. That's a word of caution from Jeremy. Long time hope people. Meals from the heartland was a vision that Max had. What would happen if this church could come together and feed a million people? 
And so the church came together because that's what happens. A million people were fed and then they did it a year after and a year after and pretty soon this nonprofit that's fed millions and millions and millions of people worldwide was born. But then the unthinkable happened. We say it's unthinkable, but in reality, we, we ultimately we know at some point it's going to happen. Like at some point, this side of heaven, there is going to be a time where, where our physical lives, that they aren't going to be able to be sustained any longer. And we all know that. And intellectually, we all know that that day is going to happen. But to know it and to experience it are two entirely different things, aren't they? Well, Janelle and Natalie and Caroline, they came home and, and Max had passed away. And now they are sitting in the wake of incredible loss. And I would love to say that there are so few of us that are experiencing that right now, but that just wouldn't be truthful. And in fact, there are people right here in this room together right now that I know who are sitting in the wake of incredible loss. You know, we're a church that's been around for 30 years, and we're a church that has a lot of people that are connected to it. And I would say it's an incredible honor, but it's an honor that you don't ever want to have to have. But, but as somebody who's in my role at Hope, I have the opportunity to walk with families as they're grieving the loss of someone that they love. Just this last year at Hope, we had over 120 funerals, celebration of life services. On average, that's over two a week. I have one tomorrow. I have one a week from tomorrow. And people who are experiencing incredible loss. And so many of you are feeling the same thing. But we also know, we also know that loss isn't only experienced when we have somebody who dies. We experience loss in a multitude of different ways. Maybe you're here today, and, and thank God you haven't had somebody close to you who's died. But, but you're sitting here today, and you say, oh, I know what loss feels like. Maybe it's you sitting in the wake of losing somebody, losing a relationship. Maybe you feel like you've, you've lost the way that it once was. I was reminded of this this morning. I didn't do anything yesterday. And I woke up, and, and my back hurt. And I'm like, how did that happen? Like, God, that wasn't a part of the deal. Like, sometime after I got over 45 years of age, I wake up and things hurt. Been there before? I'm grieving that loss right now. Sometimes you realize loss in the fact that you just don't feel like you have a sound mind anymore. Or you worry about things that other people you feel just wouldn't worry about. You lose your job or you lose... Your sense of self. And you start to wonder how you start to move forward in the wake of such loss. Your feelings are expressed the same way that the psalmist expresses them in Psalm 25. The psalmist says, turn to me and have mercy. For I am alone and in deep distress. Have you been there? If you've been in that moment where you just feel so alone, and you, you, it's, 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 it's because you feel like you're in such deep distress. My problems go from bad to worse. How many times in life do we say, if I could only catch a break? We come up with like these cliches and these sayings to try to make sense of it. We say, well, bad things come in threes. Well, what happens when they come in fours? What happens when we don't have the language and, and, the, and the reasoning to explain the things that are happening in our lives? Oh, save me, God. Is it just me or does sometimes when you're experiencing times like that, it feels like God is so far away? You start to wonder, God, God if you loved me and if you're here and if you, you had power and if you were who you said and who you say that you are, why don't you do something? Why is there loss? Why is there grief? Why is there pain? Why is there heartbreak? And sometimes we think that maybe God wants us to feel that way. There's this story in John chapter 11. There is these sisters, Mary and Martha, and they had a brother, Lazarus. And Mary and Martha and Lazarus, they were, they were quite close with Jesus. 
And Lazarus had gotten sick, and so Mary and Martha, they send word to Jesus. And they say, Jesus, your friend Lazarus is sick. Please come quickly. Because Jesus had done all these things for all these people. And Mary and Martha think, if he think, if he did that for them, how much more would he do for us? But before Jesus got there, Lazarus died. And Jesus shows up and Martha says to Jesus, Lord, if only... If only you had been here. I think we all say that at times. Shortest passage in all of Scripture. John eleven thirty five. When I was in confirmation, we had to memorize 10 scripture passages every year. And this was number one for me because I'm like, I can memorize that one. Shortest verse in all of scripture. I was a pastor's kid. I was looking for the easy way out. And what I mem memorized out of convenience ended up being something that would serve me quite well for the entirety of my life. Why did Jesus weep? Have you thought about that? Why did Jesus weep? I mean, there wasn't a moment of, of Jesus' uh, experience where he wondered what the outcome was going to be for Lazarus. Lazarus' future wasn't up for grabs. Jesus knew exactly what he was going to do in that moment. It wasn't like Jesus showed up and Martha said, if only you would have been here. And Jesus said, oh, nuts. I wasn't. Oh, well, now what are we going to do? Everything's out of my control. I have, no, I have no answer to what just happened to Lazarus. No, Jesus knew. He knew what he was going to do. He knew, he knew how it was going to end for Lazarus. So why did Jesus weep? Because you have a God whose heart breaks when your heart breaks. Oh, what hope that brings. That any kind of loss that you would ever experience in your life, even when it's something that happens because of something we've done, Jesus doesn't look at us. God doesn't look at us and say, well, it's your own fault. Any loss that you have, any pain that you have, any hurt that you have, God's heart breaks because he sees you, he loves you, and he doesn't want that to be a part of you. Because he knows the painful, of re painful reality of what happens when we're all alone. And that's what grief does. It isolates us. We kind of tell ourselves that nobody would ever understand what it is that we're feeling. Or we don't venture out and we don't con connect with people the way that we used to because maybe those people are people that we used to connect to with the person that we lost. Or we don't want to connect with people because we're scared. Like if we go and we start to get back to living, that what happens if I'm in the middle of my moment and I start to lose it? Like that would be the end of everything. Or maybe we feel alone when we've suffered loss because the people around us don't know what to say to us. And it's isolation that kills us. It does. It was during the Depression, the rate of people who were having to, to, to give their children up to wards of the state or orphanages was on the rise. People found themselves in a place where they couldn't provide for the most primary basic needs of their babies. And everybody knows that the most primary and basic needs we have as human beings is food, water, and shelter. And so with the rise of all of these babies that were going into these orphanages, the orphanages were doing the best they could to satisfy those most basic needs. And they realized and they were horrified that it was something that was happening. That there were infants that were dying of starvation with the bottle that was placed to their lips. And they realized that the most primary need that you and I have is not food, water, or shelter. It's love. That even before that baby was able to formulate a word, that baby knew that the baby was all alone. It termed, 
They coined a term called anaclytic depression. What the word anaclytic means is it literally means to lean on. That those babies were perishing because they knew that they had nobody to lean on. That they were alone. It's what gave rise to how much skin-to-skin contact an infant must have. I remember when our kids were born. Like our kids were born and the doctor's like, oh, it's a boy. Oh, it's a girl. And they're like, dad, do you want to hold them? I'm like, no, clean them off first. Like that's awful. (laughs) But then they handed them to my wife. And the first thing she did is she placed them on her chest and she just held them. And oh, was that life-giving for her. But you want to know who it was truly life-giving for? For them. This is biblical. Genesis chapter 2. It's at the dawn of creation. This is before sin entered into the equation. God says when he forms the first human being, he says it is not good for the human to be alone. This is before sin and pain and death and anything that would take life from us was in the picture. But Jesus says it's not good to be alone. And this is precisely what was impacting the man that Jesus encountered at the Pool of Bethesda. Pool of Bethesda was this area in Jerusalem that that people would go to because they thought that there were healing properties in the water. And so the thought was, is if you would get to the pool and you're able to get into the waters, as soon as the waters would stir, as soon as the waters would bubble, that the first person that was in would have the best chance of being healed. So there was a man that we hear about in John chapter 5 who had been going to the pool of Bethesda for 38 years. 38 years. If that man existed today, he had been going to that pool every day since 1986. Every day. Waiting for somebody to come along who would help him find healing. And Jesus looks at the man and he asks this question that at the surface, it seems so offensive, doesn't it? Jesus looks at the man and says, would you like to get well? Now, sometimes we we hear that and we think, is Jesus just being mean? Of course the guy, he's been going to the same place for 38 years. He spent his entire life hoping and dreaming and praying that he'd be healed. And Jesus says, well, do you want to be made well? Jesus isn't being offensive. He's asking a deeper question. He's asking the man, do you want to be made whole? Because we know that we can go through life without anything that is taking life for us and still not feel whole. And God's greatest intention for us is that we'd experience what it means to be whole. That's what Janelle was lacking. That was the void that had been created when she lost her husband and she felt all alone and that is when the church stepped in. Take a look. One of the things that had been mentioned to me around the time of the funeral was grief share and I had never heard of it. I don't know that why you would ever be aware of grief share unless you needed it. Grief share is a 13 week once a week meeting with other grievers of all different types of loss. And it was an amazing sense of not feeling so alone in my grief. That sense of knowing that other people were experiencing some of the same things just was a relief. And at the end of that first 13 weeks, I knew that I was in a very different place than when I had started at week one but I couldn't remember week one and two and three. So I did the entire 13 weeks a second time, which is not unusual with grief share. I felt like it was a lifeline for me at that time to surround myself with with that group of people. And um, Dan Cook and Colette Nelson were the leaders, both groups, and they were phenomenal. 
community is key. And that was maybe because we were grieving in COVID, maybe I think Grief Share was the, my first chance to be in a community. When you isolate in grief, it's hard to move forward because you're just kind of stuck in the same place and you kind of don't seek ways to move forward and start to leave some of the feelings behind. People leave with a sense of hope. I think the biggest support that we knew we had was prayer. And more than any other time in my life, I felt that people were praying for me. I knew people were praying for me and it was carrying me. I could just be honest about how I didn't feel strong on my own, that I just was relying sometimes every five minutes on God. Knowing that I didn't have to figure out a way to get through all of this by myself, that I didn't have to come up with my own thoughts and my own strength, and that God was already ahead of me in it and was just going to leave me, I have everything that I need. We need each other. You know that. Too often we don't acknowledge it or act like it, but we need each other. What Janelle needed was people who could carry her when she couldn't carry herself. For her, it was grief share. For some of you, it's been other things. There's so many different ways. That's one of the reasons why we say all the time, get plugged in, get plugged in, get plugged in. It's so good to come to weekly worship. It's so good to come to weekly worship. That's where it all starts. But then find your group. Find your community. We need each other. Wisdom literature of the Old Testament, the book of Ecclesiastes. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can help reach out. But if somebody who falls alone, somebody who falls alone is in real trouble. Last summer we were at my parents' lake cabin. We went over the 4th of July and at their lake, every 4th of July, there's a boat parade. And the reason there's a boat parade is there are a lot of people on the lake who are retired who have too much time on their hands. So they do this boat parade. And so my mom, because we were going to be in town, she's like, well, we're going to be the boat that everyone's going to have to check in with. So we would be in their pontoon because they're retired and they have a pontoon. And I wanted a ski boat. They got a pontoon. And they have the money, so they won. So they have a pontoon. And so then we had a bunch of stuff that we would give to people. And it was the Lake Association that bought all these things, but they were these big squirt guns, which we learned don't give the people the squirt guns first because you give them the squirt gun, then you get water in the face. So we give them a squirt gun, we give them water, we give them some candy, all of these things. And our son Trey, who uh, was going to be a seventh grader, he's a seventh grader now, he's like, I want to be the one that hands this stuff out. And we're like, hey, why don't we just throw this stuff from one boat to the other? He's like, no, let's get close because then I can straddle the two boats and I can just hand it to him personally. You know where this is going. And we're like, that's not going to work, big guy. He's like, what would it it work? It's like, well, when two boats get close, you don't want the boats to hit. So you put a little bit of reverse in it so you don't clang together. He's like, well, that's fine. I'm so strong I can keep the boats together. (laughs) Isn't it interesting how our our knee-jerk reaction in life is to think we can do it all on our own? We laugh at him, but we do it ourselves. So the first one comes, and he's got one foot on one boat, the other foot on the other boat. And sure enough, it starts to happen. And his legs are getting wider and wider and wider. And he looks at me like, Dad, aren't you going to help me? And I'm like, no, you put yourself in the own, your own spot. Expe- no, ab- I, I, absolutely. I helped him because my dad told me to. Like, I had to. <laughs> what happens when you fall alone? What happens when you get to a place where things have been divided in such a way that you can't pull them back together again? Do you have those people? Statistics will show that the average American male has 0.7 friends. That's awful. That's unfortunate. Women are so much better at this. My wife, her group of friends, it's unbelievable. She's with them. All, and women have more words than guys do. And so, like, we'll get to the end of the day, and she's just on her phone. like I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, I'm having to send text messages back to everybody who sent me text messages today. I'm like, how many did you get? Like 70 unread texts. I'm like, I haven't gotten 70 texts in my lifetime. 
And so it's like, whoop, because you know that sound it makes. Whoop, 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 whoop. I'm like, you're going to put the dog in the basement. The dog's scared. Like, what's going on? And she's like, I'm just texting people back. And her group, this is, this is her group. These, these are the women that she, like, they, they have so much fun. They laugh. Like, some of the times when they're texting at night, they're laughing so hard that the rest of us are like, what's going on with mom? But they also pick each other up when one is down. One of Bridget's best friends, one of the women in this group, she lost her dad just a couple months ago. And so the group came together. And they picked her up when she couldn't stand on her own. Do you have a group like this? Paul says to the church in Galatia, he says, share each other's burdens. Don't do life alone. Share each other's burdens. And in this way, you obey the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? Jesus was asked a question. What's the most important commandment of all the commandments? What did Jesus say? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor. And then Jesus tells a story about a guy who was beaten and robbed and left for dead on the side of the road. Who couldn't take care of his needs. Who couldn't sustain his life. And two people passed him by and they didn't do a thing, but then the good Samaritan came and gave everything he had away to the one who was in need. To bring him life when he was close to losing it. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, you're the light of the world. Let your light, so sh- let, let your light shine. And he says, you're the salt of the earth. We hear that passage and we think, oh, that just means that Jesus says that we're like the, the spice or the taste of life. It's deeper than that. At the time of Jesus, there was no refrigeration. So if you had food that you were trying to keep that was perishable, You had to do something to try to preserve it. So people used salt. So anything that was perishable, they would take salt and they would pack that meat with salt in order to preserve its life. Now that scripture passage takes a whole lot more meaning, doesn't it? Jesus says to you, he says to me, he says to us as a community, he says, you are the salt of the earth. You have the message, the promise of Jesus Christ that the world desperately needs to know that there's someone who comes that can preserve that which they're losing. Jesus says in Matthew 18, when two or more are gathered in my name, I'm with them. What we're doing here together right now is holy. You may have thought this morning that you didn't need to go to church, but the person next to you needed you here. I needed you here. We need each other. And it's not just our presence to one another. It's what our presence points to. So it was her group that got her going again. But her group couldn't carry her forever. Only God can do that. Take a look. There's so many points of indecision, especially as a widow. I have to make these decisions by myself and I don't feel alone in them. I know that God is in the decision with me. I think sometimes the What's been frightening is when God is leading me, but I'm thinking, really, God? I don't know if that's what I had in mind, but I will trust you. I know you will provide. And each day, one day at a time, I've come to the point of more than four years since I started just surrendering every morning. This day is yours and just give me the strength. It's just been such a relief. God has really replaced my need to know and my need to plan with a sense of peace. Lord, you are my shepherd. You are my shepherd. (laughs) I have so much trust that 
whatever happens, it'll be okay because God's got it. That isn't to say that everything's good all the time because a lot of it isn't. And a lot of times have been extremely challenging and there's been a lot of fear. I just always know that, that God's in control. One of the nights of Grief Share is a night we call Heaven Night. And Pastor Murph Hudson from Hope Crimes joins us. It's fascinating to hear people ask their questions. My questions were things like, does Max still love me? I just, that was so important to me. Um, and, and Murph had this amazing response that he loves me more now than ever because he's in the presence of God. And in the presence of God, there is only love. And that was just amazing to, to understand that. This is not forever. We will have an eternity together. We will be back to, reunited in heaven. Starting to shift to that mindset when I was able to has, has helped a lot. So we just talk about it a lot and laugh and tell stories. I would say I think we're doing really well at a place I don't believe I could have seen in the early months. It's still hard a lot of days, but we miss him, we miss him a ton. His absence is huge. It's not like it's, it gets better and stays better. That's kind of the roller coaster of grief. You're just sort of on the ride, I guess. You just have to navigate it one day at a time. I would wake up every morning and pray to God that he would give me the strength I need to get through that day. And every night I would thank God for giving me the strength to get through that day. And that was how I managed in those early days. And it's how I manage today. I still say that prayer every morning. I have scripture that I recite every morning that reminds me where my strength comes from. I just have been aware that I have surrendered it all. If you're experiencing loss of any kind, if you're hurting in any way, don't carry it alone. You, you can tell yourself, well, I should just be able to get over this. Or you can tell yourself that enough time has passed, I, I should be past this by now. That's not God's voice that's telling you that. If you are hurting, reach out to your church. You say, well, I'm a guest, I'm a visitor. You're welcome here. Reach out to us. We'll help to carry you, but we're gonna point you to the one who can save you. The Lord is my shepherd. Did you hear Janelle say that? The Lord is my shepherd. And then she said it again. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. Even when I walk through the deepest, darkest valley, I will fear no evil. Why? Because I know that you're with me. I know that your presence is beside me, behind me, in front of me, inside of me. That it's healing that Jesus wants to give us. But sometimes the, the, the greatest healing we need is healing that moves from the inside out. When you hear the good news, when you hear the truth, when you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God wins in the end, that there's no hurt, there's no pain, there's nothing in all of creation that God doesn't have an answer to, we start to have peace, the peace that transcends all human thought and understanding. And that peace guards our heart and guards our mind and keeps us rooted in the truth of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lived, who died, who raised, was raised from the dead. And in that we can know that even though it feels like we're out of control, God's never been out of control. He is absolutely in control. He says to the man, do you want to get well? I wonder what was more healing. What Jesus is about to do or the fact that Jesus saw him in his hurt. Jesus looks at the man and he says to the man, he says, stand up, stand up. And we simply think that about that from the standpoint like he was sitting and now he's standing. In the, in the language of the New Testament, this word stand up, you want to know what it means? It means to be raised. It means to, 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 to be brought from, from death to life. 
It means to experience life in the, in the fullness. It, it, it means to experience life the way that God intended you to live it. Now, the fact that the guy gets to stand up and walk, that's just icing on the cake. But you want to know what the guy isn't doing right now? He's not walking. You want to know what the guy is doing right now? He's living. He's in heaven. He's in eternity. He received the promise. It doesn't mean that we don't ask for the healing and the, and the, the, the hope that we need right now. No. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, ask it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find it. Knock the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives. To all who seek will find. And to everyone who knocks, that door will be open. Jesus goes on. He said, how many of you parents, if your child asked you for bread, would give them a stone instead? You wouldn't do that. You want to give good gifts to your children. How many of you parents, if your child asked you for a fish, would give them a snake or a scorpion, something that would hurt them? Of course you wouldn't. And then Jesus said, says, how much more would your Father in heaven give to you? We have a how much more God. You have a how much more God. Mary and Martha said, Jesus, if only you had been here. Jesus says, I've, I've, always, I've always been here. Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. What I have to give to you there's no expiration date on it. It lasts forever. Your brother Lazarus will be raised physically, but he will die again. But I'm going to give him life, and I'm going to give him a life that will last forever. Don't miss that. Don't underestimate the gift of life that God has for you, even in your grief, even in your loss. Even if you feel like you're all alone and nobody could ever know what it is that you're feeling. God does. That's why he sent his son Jesus in to the world. And there's nothing in creation that can separate you from that. That's what Paul says. You're never alone. You're never alone. And neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, not our fears for today, not our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell, Paul says, could ever separate us from the love of God that's revealed to us in Christ Jesus our Lord. Healing is here. You may feel lost, but God has come to find you. So as we close today, I'm going to invite the prayer partners to come out. If you, if you need someone just to pray over you, Please, during this song, come out and receive prayer. It doesn't mean that something horrible is going on in your life. Maybe you're just stepping into the place where you say, hey, can't do it on my own anymore. Praise God for that. I need somebody's help. Praise God for that. And you'll hear the gospel, the good news of Jesus. Praise God for that. So we're going to stand so it's more comfortable for people to move. And then we're going to worship and we're going to talk about the healing that comes in God's presence. Amen? Amen. Thank you so much for tuning in and joining us for Service Online. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. We don't think it's any accident that you're here and we have been praying for you. To see more of our content, know when we go live and stay up to date week to week, feel free to subscribe to this channel. And if you live close by one of our campuses or local sites, we invite you to check us out in person. We would love to meet you. And don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date. See you next week.